Oregon's 2025 recruiting class just got one name larger, literally, with Zaire Addison. Here we go. You are Locked On Ducks, your daily podcast on the Oregon Ducks. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, it is that time once again for Locked On Ducks. I'm your host, Spencer McLaughlin. Thank you so much for making this your first listen or your first view every day. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, and your number one source to stay up to date with the Ducks, which is why if you have not already, please like, comment, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to or watch this show, which today is brought to you by our friends at LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. And that is why LinkedIn Jobs helps find the right people for your team faster and for free. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college terms and conditions do apply. Lots to get to today. We'll talk about a couple other guys from last year's team that could be in store for bigger years. Maybe, maybe not. And then we got a little bit of everything to wrap up today's show. But we start with Zaire Addison, the latest commitment in Oregon's 2025 class, four-star offensive tackle, first offensive lineman to commit since Chavez Sandman Thompson decommitted. He was a three-star guy, also out of the state of Florida. And that is where Zaire Addison comes from. Sumner High School in Riverview, Florida, 6'5", 290 pounds. This is the first guy in the trenches on the offensive side of the ball that Oregon has added. I doubt it will be the last. More on that in a moment. But Addison, top 25 tackle in the class of 2025. Depending on which service you look at, I think on threes got him a little bit higher than does 24-7 sports, which has him as about the number 23 tackle in the class. He had been considering Florida, Florida State, Penn State, amongst others, and what I have heard is that this is going to be a very solid Oregon commitment in that verbal commits are not national letters of intent. Other schools can call, they can text, they can try to get visits, players will take visits whilst committed to other schools. Having a verbal commitment really means this school is heavily in the lead, and if I had to sign my NLI today, not NIL, NLI, then I would sign with this school, but there's still a ways to go. I think Zaire Addison is about as solid as it gets. And this is not going to be the last offensive lineman Oregon gets in the 2025 class, but he is the first. And it's pretty notable because that's a position where Oregon's going to lose a lot after this year. And, you know, you had Feo Pelalaulu, who was a rotation player on the offensive line a season ago. He retired as a part of the coaching staff, I believe. You're going to lose, in all likelihood, four starters from this year's offensive line. So yeah, the 2023 and 24 recruiting classes, those offensive linemen, yeah, they're going to be critically important. But it's a position where you can have big overhauls like this, where, you know, guys come in together, they play for several years, they develop, maybe they don't play for their first year or two, get themselves into playing shape, and then they play for and start for two or three seasons, and then they move on. I remember a Mario Cristobal offensive line the one that you know ended up being uh, having Panay Sewell as the true freshman left tackle. Everybody else was like a junior or senior, and they'd all started as true freshmen. And they kind of grew together in the program, and the offensive line was really, really good. As, as we know, I don't remember if that was 19 or if that was in uh, 21, but I remember that group with uh, Jake Hansen and uh, Shane Lemieux, Calvin Throckmorton, those guys. Ryan Walk, uh, I think, was uh, was a part of that as well. So. That, that happens pretty often along the offensive line because it's really hard to play as a true freshman. I mean, Connerly was the number one offensive tackle in the class in 22, and he was the sixth offensive lineman for, for the Ducks that year. That's how good the offensive line was. There are other places he might have started right away. But it's definitely a position group Oregon is going to need multiple recruit or multiple commitments at. I'd expect at least three don't know if they'd go over five offensive linemen in the cycle, but Zaire Addison is the first. Other names to watch for at this position, Michael Fasusi, who's a five-star offensive tackle. That's a guy that Oregon is after. Douglas, or after. Douglas U2 is out of the Las Vegas area. Another blue chip recruit that, that Oregon is, is pursuing in the 2025 cycle. But uh, Zaire Addison is the latest, 6'5", 290 pounds. He's the eighth overall commit in the class of 2025 and he's you know according to 24 7 sports rankings about the fourth highest player in uh, highest ranked player in the class but you know it kind of gets 
weird when you look at their star ratings on 24 seven versus the composite. Like he, he is a notable commitment because not just because he's the first offensive lineman, but because he's from the Florida area. And it's just got to feel a little bit strange for Florida state and Florida to have Oregon, which is a long ways away, come and pull this kid right out of their backyard. But that's what Oregon did. That man, Alik Terry, he's pretty darn good. I, I'll be honest. I was worried when Adrian Clem left because I thought Clem was a stud. He was. Adrian Clem was very good. And Alik Terry has also been very good. He's recruited at a high level. Productivity has been good. I think this year is going to be a pretty big test. You know, having Poncho slide over to center, he's not as experienced as JPJ was when he slid over to center last year, but that transition went very, very well. But uh, I, I like Alik Terry. This is the first of several offensive line commits he'll get in the class of 2025. Oregon now has the 22nd ranked class nationally, according to 24-7. An interesting question to think about, how high are those numbers going to go? Eight verbal commits right now, and the number 22 class in the country. I fully expect Oregon to land a top 10 class, and it's going. most of it is going to be built out over the next several weeks. That is going to be a consistent topic and, and recurring theme on the show for my everydayers out there. Because that is what the summer months are when your recruiting class mostly gets built. If you go look at the 2024 class, most of those kids committed in the summer. Yeah, there were some in the fall. There were some earlier in the winter. Like, yeah, that that, that happens. But Oregon's going to be probably in the 20-ish range for high school commits. And that should be able to move them inside the top 10. Now, another development with this uh, Zaire Addison commitment is DJ Pickett was recently on a visit with the Ducks, or at least has been. I think he's been on campus a couple times. He's a five-star defensive back. And Zaire Addison retweeted uh, a picture from DJ Pickett's visit at Oregon, encouraging him to come join the flock with the Ducks. Now, you see this all the time in college football recruiting. Kids commit somewhere, and then you know they start talking to other players and trying to get them to go and form kind of a movement and whatnot. I think it helps that Oregon has a quarterback already committed and they might be going after another. I'm going to talk about that with Brian Smith later this week. But I like where Oregon's at. I, I think they're in a solid spot. I'd expect their overall ranking to rise pretty quickly once commitments start coming in. One name to watch for who's committing this Thursday is four-star linebacker Mason Posa, who has Oregon in his top schools uh, along with Wisconsin and Texas A&M. There are a lot of other names out there. They're starting to, to really pop up, and they're going to be committing in the coming weeks, and official visits are going on. This is big-time crew season, and Oregon's 2025 class is going to get made in the majority in the next, what is this, June? I don't know, six weeks or so, six, six seven weeks. Hence why the show rolls along in the summer. And the mailbag questions keep coming in. And your guys' pop candidates for 2024 keep rolling in as well. And there are two names, not one, but two names that we got to talk about next. One of them, Treshawn Holden, a fascinating player to discuss. This episode is brought to you by our friends over at LinkedIn. When you're hiring for your small business, you want to find quality professionals that are right for the role, obviously, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs has the tools to help find the right professionals for your team faster and for free. LinkedIn is not just a job board. LinkedIn helps you hire professionals that you can't find anywhere else, even those who aren't actively searching for a new job but might be open to that perfect role. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't even visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you're looking in the wrong place. On LinkedIn, 86% of small businesses get a qualified candidate within 24 hours. Hire professionals like a professional on LinkedIn. Two and a half million small businesses use LinkedIn for hiring with good reason. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on college. That's linkedin.com slash locked on college to post your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. A little second segment sip and we're right back into it. So, I asked all of you a while back to submit who you think might be a pop candidate for Oregon this year. The definition of a pop candidate is someone that was on the team last year that could have a bigger statistical impact or a bigger role, at the very least, on this year's team. If you've got a name that I haven't discussed, 
get into the mailbag. YouTube comments or X, formerly known as Twitter, at S. McLaughlin CFB or at Locked on Ducks. If you want priority access and all sorts of other perks, you can join the flock over at Subtext. That link in the description below. $5 a month after a 14-day trial. Absolutely not a requirement. So a couple of pop candidates that came across my eyes, screen, whatever you want to call it, screen, eyes, you get what I'm saying. Let's start with Treshawn Holden. I'm a big Treshawn Holden fan. I, I I really, really like Holden, not just because of the, the personality that he exuberates when he's around the game of football and the way he plays, the passion he plays with, the physicality, the versatility that he has. I mean, this is a guy who really played at four levels for, for Oregon in the receiver room a year ago. Shorter routes, medium routes, deeper routes, behind the line of scrimmage and gadget stuff. He can do it all. He's a really versatile guy. He reminds me of kind of a faster Juwan Johnson. Where he's a big bodied receiver. I think in the NFL, like Juwan Johnson, he could play tight end. I'm telling you, I've mentioned that prediction before or made that comparison before. If, if Treshawn Holden gets into the NFL and converts to play tight end, I might quit this show and go apply for a job to be an NFL scout. Don't worry, I wouldn't do that to you, but I'd consider it. Anyway, so a year ago, Holden caught 37 passes for 452 yards and six touchdowns, all of which set or tied his his career highs. He's going into his fifth year of college football, and this is a guy who has never been a number one target and isn't going to be a number one target on Oregon's team this year. The receiving core is just too good and too deep, mostly Evan Stewart, but Tez Johnson as well. The reason I say mostly Evan Stewart is... I think every receiving core, a lot of receiving cores, because no no two are the same, have a top target on the perimeter and a top target from the slot or on the inside. Whether that's a slot receiver or a tight end depends on where you're looking. You go to Utah, for instance, they use their tight ends extensively, and it works very well for them. I mean, Dalton Kincaid was a first-round draft pick. I guess a stud on the Buffalo Bills. Oregon doesn't use their tight ends that often, but certainly they use them effectively. Slot receivers have had more success, and that was true last year, of course, with Tez Johnson setting the Oregon single-season receptions record and having a 1,000-yard campaign. So I think for Treshawn Holden, he's not going to play in the slot. He's a guy who plays on the outside, plays that Z position. I think you play X to, like, he, he's, he's really, really athletic, big-body dude. I think he's the number two guy on the perimeter to Evan Stewart, who is a first or second round NFL draft pick if he hits his full potential. And, you know, I I think it's worthy to talk uh, on, on, on a show at some point what Evan Stewart's potential could be, how many yards he could go for with Dylan Gabriel back there. But for Treshawn Holden, I, first of all, I love having him there in the event. Hopefully it doesn't happen, of course, but it's football. It happens that Evan Stewart gets hurt. Yeah, Holden's not a high-end draft pick the way Stewart is. I just don't feel like in college there would be a dramatic drop-off between the two. I've said before, I'll say again, I would still love Oregon's receiver room if they hadn't brought in Evan Stewart. But they did. So according to Pro Football Focus, it's the best in all of college football. And I think you can make that argument pretty reasonably. I would be surprised, not, not shocked, but Holden last year... 37 catches, 452 yards, and six touchdowns. He's one of many guys that you feel like could get the ball more, should get the ball more. That's a great problem for Oregon to have. feels like Will Stein says that about several players, whether it's Holden, Tiford, Kenyon Sadiq. I think that the connection between Gabriel and Stewart will determine whether Holden sets a new career high in receiving yards. I could see him doing it. I could see him popping for closer to 50 catches, closer to 700 yards receiving. And maybe Evan Stewart, instead of being where Troy Franklin was a year ago in the 1,400-yard range, maybe he's closer to 1,000 yards or 1,100, like where Tez Johnson was, and those yards kind of get siphoned off to Treshawn Holden. I think that could absolutely be a guy that that has a career season and builds upon his numbers from, from a season ago. 
And, and like I said, you can throw him 50-50 balls. He can get you yards after the catch. He can be a factor in the screen game. I think he blocks fairly well. I haven't checked his PFF grade, but you know, he's a big guy. I, I don't recall him seeing him miss a bunch of blocks or anything. And he just plays with a fire. I, I'm, I'm a big, big Trayshawn Holden fan. Another one that uh, came in for a pop can is Roderick Pleasant. So this one is is trickier. I think Holden's far more likely v- between these two guys to pop than Pleasant. Pleasant could replace Nico Reed at some point. Like, Nico Reed is a solid player. He's fine, but he's nothing special. And I think that the reason I make that comparison or say that's the avenue for Roderick Pleasant, who was a really highly touted four-star recruit, one of the fastest players in the class of 2023 um, in the country, I think his physical gifts are probably slightly higher than Nico Reed's. I think physically on the field, they can play the same sort of spot, which is kind of that smaller nickel corner. Kamari Terrell falls into this category too, where they just got high level speed. They're a little bit bigger. They can play on the outside. I don't know if Pleasant's a guy that pops this year. I think he'd be a candidate to be a starting corner in 2025. I just don't know about this season. I think he you know, works his way onto the depth chart somewhere. Just don't know about... I, I I don't I don't know if he's going to be able to see the field consistently, not because he's isn't talented, but because the secondary is just so deep. There's so much experience. But then after this year, from the cornerback room, you're going to lose Jabbar Muhammad to the NFL draft, and I think he's out of eligibility as well. Dante Manning will be gone. We'll see if Jaleel Florence is making himself into an NFL draft pick. I think he'd probably have to stay healthy this season and have a, a big time year. But certainly, he's a really talented guy. Like you're going to see several names depart the the Oregon corner room as it currently looks, and that'll create a, more of an opportunity for him to play. Last year, he played primarily on special teams. He was in on uh, USC's two-point conversion late in the game when it was still in question. Oregon had some injuries and Pleasant was there. I'm pretty sure he also forced the fumble uh, against Liberty in in the Fiesta Bowl. So he's not the furthest guy down the depth chart. I just think the corner room is a tough, tough place to find a a lot of opportunities this year. But if he's playing, it's because he's really, really uh, impressing the coaches. Again, submit your pop candidates. Love evaluating those guys uh, going into the season. This question came in from Bud. Why is it some states have two or more major college football programs, while many others only have one, such as Arkansas, Connecticut, Louisiana, Maryland, and a bunch of others? Uh, Small population doesn't seem to be a factor. Yeah, this goes back to um, the number of land-grant universities given to a state and our favorite topic, conference realignment. So it's really easy to look at conference realignment and say, okay, this has never happened before. There's all this movement. It's crazy. At this level, I don't know if it's taken place, but schools have moved conferences many a times, including Oregon, by the way. The Pacific Coast Conference was was a thing once upon a time, and it used to be the Pac-8, and then it was the Pac-10. Did you know that the Big 12 was once the Big 8? They have 16 teams in that league this year. So schools move around a lot. But the number of schools in a state where you play major college football goes back to, you know, what 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 takes place from a legislative level and how many universities are are sponsored. Because Oregon, Oregon State are both public universities. So they they get public funding and they they play football at the highest level they can. Oregon State, unfortunately, no longer a part of power football. Oregon, thankfully, is going into the Big Ten. But it's not all about population. It, it plays a factor. It plays a factor. And, and I don't know every detail. I know that the, the history of how you get a school to ha- then have a football team and be in a conference, it goes back to, to the 20s and 30s. And uh, college football has been around for a very, very long time. Once upon a time, here's a fun fact. I watched this documentary a while ago. It's called The American Game. It's on ESPN+. Plus. It's so good. It's about college football, and it's utterly fantastic. It was like seven episodes. I watched it in a day. It, I, I could not get enough of it. Highly, highly recommend. They went back and, and looked at, you know, kind of the history of the sport and all the, the pageantry and tradition. And when TV first began broadcasting college football, I mean, like the first time they ever did it, the pushback was that, television was going to kill college football because people wouldn't go to the games. 
<laughs> I'm chuckling because people didn't stop going to the games, but television... <laughs> When I say television and college football, do you have a positive association in your mind? Or do you have that association of it forced Oregon to go to the Big Ten because that was the best way for the school to survive, which it clearly was. It's interesting. Some Sometimes people that are old man yelling at this guy turn out to be right. So keep the mailbag questions coming. Got plenty more to get to. Uh, my apologies to music guests underscore some numbers who submitted a question as well. Will not have time for it on today's show, but I will get to it tomorrow to be sure. We got more to get to. And you know that word potpourri that's over there on the rundown, if you're watching it on YouTube? That means a little bit of everything. So that's what's coming up next. A little bit of everything. This episode is brought to you by our friends over at FanDuel. And summertime means, for me, playing a lot of golf. It also means baseball is on. Mariners had a walk-off Grand Slam. I love to see it. The NBA Finals. Always a good time with Mike Breen and more. They've got everything over there and you can bet it all on FanDuel. You can bet golf as well. US Open's coming up this week for my golf friends out there. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's 200 bucks you can use to bet on everything from finals MVP to who's gonna hit one out of the park. Everything you want. Oregon's win total, conference championship odds, national title odds. They're minus 250 to make the playoff. Our good friend Daniel Lanning better make the playoff or might be kind of disappointing. Visit Fandle.com slash locked on. Add a big win to your summer bucket list. Fandle.com slash locked on. Fandle, America's number one sports book and our official sports book sponsor here at the Locked On Network. All right, so I've had time to process the utter disaster that was Oregon baseball's end of the season this year. And I said yesterday on the show, and I still feel, horrible end to a great season. Making a second straight Super Regional is, is just not a small thing. It is not a small thing. Super Regionals are the equivalent of making the Sweet 16 in the NCAA tournament. You got to the second weekend. It takes a lot of work. It's not easy. You can have a good team capable of going far, and you don't get past the first weekend. It happens. It happens. So... One thing that I felt was most impressive, and of course this this thought that I that I have is a little bit hard to explain given what took place over the weekend, but I'll do my best to do so. I think the most impressive part of and and I saw a college baseball pundit on Twitter point this out as well. The most impressive part of getting back to the Super Regionals this year is last year, Oregon's team was completely defined by its offense. They would just out-hit teams, much like Texas A&M this year. And we saw that on display. 13 runs a game in, in the two wins over Oregon. Pitching had been doing well. But last year, Oregon had a dangerously good lineup. Riku Nishida, Sabine Ceballos, and guys like Jacob Walsh from this year's team, they lost six of their seven top hitters from a year ago and went to the Super Regionals. That's really hard to do. That's really hard to do when that's the focal point of your team. If Oregon hadn't been an offensive program, that's one thing. But to lose such a huge chunk, two-thirds of the lineup, basically, from a year ago, and to get back to the Supers is a feather in Mark Wazikowski's cap and his entire staff and the improvements they made in the pitching staff. Now, they need to find a way to keep guys healthy because you have to imagine the lack of depth, losing guys like Michael Friend and others in the pitching staff down the stretch is why Brock Moore was left in for so long in the seventh inning. And I was critical of that move yesterday on today's sh- or on, on the show. I, I still feel that way. That was he, he, he was in there for way too long. Like if a guy comes in and hits a grand slam, like, you know, okay, well, you would have rather he made a better pitch, but make him earn it, make him earn it, make him do it. Don't, don't literally let them stand up there and take seven walks in an inning. That should never happen. After the third walk in an inning for a reliever, you're done. You're done. Don't care what else has happened. Don't care who's coming up. Third walk in an inning, you're out. That, that's, that's just where I'd be. That was a mistake. But the pitching staff this year was night and day from a season ago. As bad as the pitching was, in the Super Regionals against Texas A&M, which shows you there's, there's more growth to be had. 
but the growth from last year has been substantial. You would not have seen a pitching performance like the ones we saw collectively in the regionals this year against San Diego and Santa Barbara twice. And Santa Barbara was a darn good team. You would not have seen that a year ago. You wouldn't have seen, I don't know if you would have seen that ever since Mark Wasikowski got there. They have been all about slugging, about hitting the, about hitting the ball. You just wouldn't have seen it. Think about Chip Kelly when he was at Oregon back in the early 2010s. They were all about offense, right? The unsung hero of that Oregon rise to national prominence was Nick Aliotti because Chip didn't know, care, or do anything on the defensive side of the ball, and Aliotti was brilliant. And that national championship game about Auburn, as crappy as it was, is one of the best defensive performances from a coaching staff I have ever seen. When you look at the, the caliber of players, the size of players on Auburn versus Oregon, they had no business holding Cam Newton to 22 points. They had no business doing it, but Aliotti was really good. And the coaching there is reminiscent of the coaching job here and the work done with these Oregon pitchers and putting together a staff and developing them throughout the year. They were brilliant in the regionals. That shift in identity, that's a hard thing to do. That's a really hard thing to do. It's the equivalent of, you know, another example for Oregon would be Dana Altman's teams suddenly scoring 85 points a game because they lost, you know, a key defensive piece. Like if next year, or, you know, Dana Altman teams have been low scoring, they haven't scored a ton of points, but they've been really good defensively and hard to score on in the second half. If all of a sudden you didn't have the personnel to have an elite defensive unit and Dana Altman's teams would just said, okay, fine, we'll score 85 points a game instead of 68. And yeah, we're going to give up 78, but we're going to win a lot of those games. That's really good coaching. That's really good coaching. So I think that the, the staff, which certainly is not a... Uh, what's the, what's the word I'm looking for? They they are not viewed upon favorably by Oregon baseball fans out there because of that seventh inning. And I get it. It was a horrible inning. It was bad from the coaching staff. Not going to try and defend that. The job that they did throughout the season was exceptional. It was really really good. So I wanted to give them their their flowers for that. And I I hope you all appreciate the job that Coach Waz has done. To the point where, you know, getting to the Super Regional is not enough to satisfy the appetite of those Oregon fans that do support the baseball team. And I'm among them and many others are as well. But that's that that's impressive. It's it's really, really impressive what he has done. And hopefully next year they can stay a little bit healthier, but also have more depth. Like they didn't they didn't have enough. If you lose a couple arms in the pen and then you're out, well, that means you need more depth. Keep recruiting, keep developing. That's why you do it couple more uh, fun questions to end today's show here from Bud. Some of my best memories involve Oregon sports. What is your first memory of attending an Oregon sporting event in person? And what is your favorite Oregon sports memory, whether from in person or a broadcast? Well, ooh, uh, that's, uh, that's tough. Those are, those, are, those are both tough. I think my favorite Oregon sports memory would be uh, Rose Bowl 2015, the Florida State beatdown. That was just, that was just glorious, man. <laughs> that, was, that was glorious. But up there as well, I think I've answered a similar question before. 2011 at Stanford, college game day, top 10 matchup, Ducks and Cardinal. I was there with my brother, my parents, and um, a couple of our best friends from the time we were kids who were my brother's age. And we just did the whole trip to San Francisco and visited Fred. We just had the best time. And then we went to the game and it was awesome. And they beat him by 20, 21 or something like that. Um, so that th- those those would be my two favorite memories uh, in person for a broadcast, you know, calling uh, an, an SU women's game at Matthew Knight Arena. Um, that was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> Easily walking into that gym and realizing I wasn't there just to watch. I was there to call a game. Uh, so those would be those would be that one. Uh, my first memory of attending an Oregon sporting event in person, um, <laughs> I think I went to one sooner, but I got to tell you, the first memory I have is not a great one. It was going to Stanford in 2009 and hearing that damn PA announcer say how it's another Toby Gearhart for a Stanford first down. We couldn't tackle the guy. <laughs> he just kept running over 
The Dark Defenders couldn't tackle him. That's the first memory I have of going to a game in person. Yeah, not the best one. All right, last one here. Uh, and by the way, I, I I am always happy to answer you know more personal questions like this. If you have an interest, by all means. By all means, I'll, uh, I'll always end the show this way. After a long hiatus, it has been a long hiatus, when you return to Eugene for the August 31st Idaho football game, what are your top three things to do or visit? Uh, well, number one is, you know, get my media credential approved, which is not a guarantee. That doesn't happen everywhere, but I'd like to hope that it will. That'd be number one. Uh, that'd be pretty surreal. Number two, tailgate. I, absolutely. You know, there are guys that I've tailgated with for a long time that are my dad's friends from from college. And, and certainly I'd love to go around and, and talk to many of you. I love doing that at the Pac-12 championship game. Um, but yeah, I just haven't been to Autzen since 2017 because I've been out and about trying to build build a broadcasting career. And then the uh, the the last thing I'd say is, you know, if I'm up in the press box, obviously it's not the same as being in the crowd, but just experience and shout and just just watching Otson do it. I can't wait. We're less than 85 days away to the start of the season. Can not wait. Appreciate everyone listening. I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful rest of your day and go Ducks.